So uh, good morning or good afternoon or good evening to everyone in the other side of my camera. I'm looking at the camera in this uh, the 16th home gemology webinar. And um, we have been doing, doing this webinar since March. Now with the support of CIBJO, the World Jewelry Confederation, and we co-edited by uh, Edward Johnson. Most of you know him by G from GIA London or from RJC. And we did learn last week that he was also uh, a jadeite expert that lived in Hong Kong for five years in the, in the 90s. So he's uh, quite a Jurassic, if I can say. <laughs> but Thank you so much, Rui. But today, um, our, our um, theme is uh, pearls, particularly famous pearls. I'm not talking about all the famous pearls because I just made a selection of those famous pearls, of the ones maybe I like the best. And um, we will cover uh, se several topics. We will begin with some archaeological finds and some really old pearls uh, related to archaeology. And also we will cover, because usually we forget the freshwater natural pearls, and we will give them a few some, some space on this webinar because some of them are quite famous and quite significant in terms of historical relevance. And also, we will discuss again a, a little bit of pearl nomenclature because many really large pearls, they are not actually pearls, they are technically called blisters or blister pearls, depending on the case. And we will discuss that nomenclature again because it's even if you attended the last webinar on pearls, I think it's worthwhile to listen to that uh, argument again. And uh, we will also uh, um, mention a few pearls that were in auction and set records and a few really interesting pearl stories. Some of those stories were told by Adi Alfardan that you see here on the picture with his father, Hassan, and his grandfather on the painting. And he shared with us a couple of webinars ago a few stories on pearls and uh, that inspired me to pick up one of his great stories and I'm going to share one of those stories again for you, but not with his lovely Arabic accent, it will be with this Portuguese English accent. So uh, here we go, archeological pearls. Uh, there are two that deserve mention and the, both of them are from the uh, Persian Gulf. The first one, it's, uh, it was considered the most, the oldest uh, uh, find, the pearl find, up until a couple of years ago, it was found in the, in, the, in the Emirates in the 2012. It's a rather small pearl, but it was carbon dated um, to 5,500 years before common era. So basically the 7,500 7, years old. It's qu quite an old pearl. And this, this proves, and it, it's, it's not new, that in the Gulf area, pearling activities really go back really long time ago. And a lot of uh, pearling areas, not only in Bahrain where the pearling uh, is concentrated today, but even around Saudi Arabia up to Kuwait or even, even down in, um, in the, here in the Emirates, you could find pearling um, sites and uh, archeological pearling evidence, which is really interesting. Maybe the most interesting pearl that was found in the Emirates was this pink natural pearl. It's locally called a wardi because it's pinkish and um, it's quite small, but look at the nacre. It's a beautiful, it looks like a very new pearl. The nacre, it's really in mint condition. And the carbon dating of the strata where this pearl was found is even older than the one that we just mentioned, making this one the oldest gulf pearl uh, on record. This means that if you really take care of your pearls, they can, uh, they can last forever. Try not to be buried uh, uh, as this pearl for 7,000 years, otherwise you will, not, you will not enjoy using the pearl, uh, only dirt. But uh, this means that pearls, if they have good conditions, they can uh, last a, a long time. Of course, I didn't bring any picture, but the old, actually the oldest pearl on record, it was found uh, last year in Mexico, and it's uh, like 1,000 years older than this one that I just shown. So, but this shows that pearling, not only in the Gulf, but also around Mesoamerica in Mexico, 
was known for a long time. Freshwater. I mean, we, we all know that pearls, they can, be, they can grow both in animals that live in freshwater, rivers, ponds, dams, but also in marine environment, in the ocean, in saltwater um, uh, in environment. But usually we forget about the freshwater chaps. And this is to show you that, for example, in Northern America, the Native Americans, they were using local shells for adornment and every now and then a pearl would come up of those local shells in rivers and ponds. And uh, in Ohio, a really famous um, Native American mound, which is called the Hopewell Mounds site in Ohio, dated 2,000 years old, has a great collection of really not very well preserved pearls, but still large and significant, historically significant pearls showing that the local Native Americans, they were fishing shells maybe for decoration, for fish bait or for food. And once they found a nice pearl, they would collect. And this is 2000 years old before the Europeans got there. So this is to make sure that freshwater pearls are deserved some room here on the famous pearl um, webinar. But of course, probably the most famous freshwater pearl ever uh, was by the gentleman. This man is Bill Albernetti. He, he, th those pictures were taken in the 1990s where it was still allowed to fish for uh, pearl mussels in Scotland. And he found a really nice pearl on a local shell. The local European shell that produced, historically produced um, pearls, not only in Scotland, but also in the Bohemia, in, uh, even in, in, we don't have much in Portugal, but we have this kind of shell here in Portugal. And as north and as far away as Finland and Russia was this uh, really, this uh, very uh, shell, the Margaritifera, Margaritifera, the European um, pearl mussel. And it was used not only for collecting the shell to make buttons, as you can see here from a St. Petersburg Museum example. But also, if you open it, you can find, eventually you can find a pearl. And this gentleman found an absolutely stunning round, because it's really rare to have a round natural pearl. But he found a nacreous, good quality round pearl uh, with a diameter bigger, higher, bigger or higher in English, I have no idea, bigger than 11 millimeters, and it was quite large. It was on a, on a jewelry shop in Perth for many, many years. Uh, I don't know the whereabouts of the pearl uh, today, but I think it was eventually sold. So, but this was the largest and the most beautiful Scottish pearl that is on record. And it was caught by that man that I just show you. Sometimes on medieval, especially medieval artifacts, when we see large, pearls like on the uh, imperial crown of the uh, holy roman empire sometimes those big pearls they are not from salt water they are from the local central european lakes and ponds and they come from the margaritifera margaritifera possibly from other mussels but mostly from that one and um, curiously uh, it's a really funny thing that uh, if you were um, a goldsmith in medieval ages, you could not set on the same artifact a uh, natural pearl from, uh, say, uh, the Gulf, it, they were called the Oriental pearls, next to a local freshwater nacreous pearl. It was forbidden. So you, you, should, you should set them on different, on different artifacts. And this is an interesting rule. Maybe we have the same thing today with synthetic diamonds or lab grounds, if you prefer the term. So let's talk about very large pearls. But before that, let's review pearl nomenclature. Don't get scared about the chart. I'm not to going to, to discuss the whole chart. You can download this chart if you download the pearl book at Sibjo website, and you will have the link momentarily. If you, uh, if, you, uh, if you don't have it, you will receive tomorrow on your email box. But let's discuss the name of blister. What does blister mean? 
Um, uh, maybe if you if you saw the uh, previous webinar on pearls, it's a repetition. I'm sorry, but it's never too much to repeat something that is quite important to make sure that everybody has clarified. Some of the largest pearls, and we will see a couple of them that exist on on, uh, on record, they are not actually pearls. They are technically called blisters. And what is a blister? Technically, uh, before I tell you what is a blister, let's discuss what is technically a pearl. A pearl is something that grows inside a mollusk. It can be a bivalve. It can be a univalve, like the abalone or a gast or the uh, sea snails, like the conch pearl. And those little things, sometimes they are not as little, they grow inside a sac of tissue, a sac of cells, like a membrane. And that membrane within which the pearl grows, it's, it's called a naturally formed pearl sac. You see, this is not a pearl sac, but this is a bag. Let's call them pearl bag for simplicity. And so it, they grow inside a bag or a sac made of cells. And you only have a pearl when that hard concretion made of calcium carbonate grows inside such a sac. Sometimes, however, you do have a few protuberances or a few concretions inside muscles, or sorry, inside mollusks, that they are not grown in pearl sacs, they just appear by other mechanisms. And one of the mechanisms, this is, imagine that this is the shell, and you have some, and this is the muscle, this is the mantle, those are the cells, and this is the hard shell, those are the cells, and they are together in the, in the, sea, in the sea bottom. And then it comes something that, like an invader, that stands here below the mantle and above the shell. And as you know, you've seen mollusks before, they don't have hands, they cannot do like this, like we do when you have a mosquito, we just scratch. They cannot scratch. What can they do? They cover the irritation with shell, with nacre, if that's the case. So what happens on such a situation is when you have an irritant in between the mantle tissue cells and the shell, what happens is the mantle starts segregating I don't know, it's, uh, it's creating, well, sorry, the English, making, producing shell, making a bubble. And that bubble, it's called blister. You have other mechanisms, which is you have the shell, and then you have something that perforated the shell, and it's like an irritant here. So what does the shell, what does the mollusk do? Covers it with some uh, layers of shell. And those guys, they are called natural, because they, they are naturally formed, blisters because they look like a bubble and we but you also have blister pearls and because you have the word pearl in there it's because something on that uh, product on that product on that thing was formed is inside a pearl sac okay so imagine that you have already a formed pearl that perforated the mantle the animal and attached to the shell and above that already formed pearl, the shell, the animal, starts segregating layers upon layers of nacre, making a blister. But because the trigger is itself a natural pearl, that one is called a pearl, a blister pearl. Natural because it's natural. Blister because it's a blister. Pearl because it has a pearl inside. And those ones, those blister pearls, are quite tricky for um, laboratory pearl experts, which I'm not one of them for sure, but you have several of them, like Ken Scarrett, Nick Sturman, Stefanos Carampelas, and some, some many more. So this is quite hard for those uh, experts to separate, but those are blisters, but those are blister pearls. But the majority of of blisters or blister pearls, if you wish, uh, the wrong nomenclature that we see on the market, they are actually not pearls, they are actually assembled cultured blisters. And we, we call them collectively Mabe pearls, and we now see here fine examples from Mexico, from the 
Perlas del Mar de Cortés, from the uh, lovely Nacrus uh, Concha Nacar, which is the Pteria sterna locally. It's beautiful colors, but those are not pearls. Those are actually cultured blisters. Not even the word pearl is applicable to this. All this thing that I, I, I'm telling you was just to make sure that you remember that one thing is a pearl. Remember, pearl sac. Cyst pearl, if you wish. It's another name for it. Another thing is a natural blister or shell blister. The other thing is a natural blister pearl. So make sure you get that right on your head. No, not easy. It took me years, 50 years to understand that. So let's talk about a really large, really large natural blister from fresh water, which is the sleeping lion. And when you see this pearl, it's really big. This remind, remind you that most of the really large pearls, if they are actually pearls, they are not actually pearls, they are actually blisters. And this one is a really lovely um, natural blister from a freshwater mussel. And it's called the sleeping lie. And it was sold in Amsterdam not that long ago for more than 300,000 euros. And uh, you have this kind of shape and it's called the sleeping lion because it looks like a sleeping lion. And some blisters, some baroque shaped blisters, sometimes they have suggestive shapes. And this one looks like a sleeping lion. So it's a quite famous one. The Journal of Gemology has published something on this pearl like 10 years ago, if you, if you want to read it. This one is another uh, blister, natural blister. It's called the Hope Pearl. It's huge, five centimeters. Five centimeters is huge, okay? It's and it's 450 carats. It was bought not for a, lot, uh, for a big amount, 100 years ago, 9,000 pounds. It was eventually sold uh, for much more uh, later on in this century. It's on a private collection and sometimes it's on display at the Natural History Museum in London. What people might not know is why the hell this pearl is called the Hope Pearl. Because we do know the Hope Diamond, right? The Hope Diamond was named after this gentleman, Henry Philip Hope, a uh, banker from uh, England. And he did buy the Hope Diamond because he was a stone collector. And along with the Hope Diamond, he also bought the Hope Spinel that now that, uh, <clears throat> it, it was sold in Bonhams. And 150 pearls, among those pearls, you had the Hope Pearl that you can see here on this picture, along with the Hope Diamond. The Hope Diamond is a, it's a really large diamond, 45 carats. But when you see it along with a huge Hope Pearl, the Hope Diamond looks like really insignificant in size. The Hope Pearl is really a giant. It's a big, big thing. And that picture, maybe those two gems haven't been together for decades, centuries, up until now. And this was on the Smithsonian a couple of years ago. Nice picture. Another really famous natural blister is the Danat Sheikha Fatima bin Mubarak, sorry about my Arabic accent, um, that is on permanent display at the Emirates, Emirates Palace Hotel in Abu Dhabi. It was formerly called the Centaur Pearl, but it was renamed after the mother of the nation of the Emirates. So this is, an, again, a really large blister it's uh, almost 900 carats. It's a huge, huge size. It's almost seven centimeters in length. It's crazy size. It was, um, um, Ken Scarrett published a note on this pearl in the Gems and Gemology in 2001. So this is not a, a new pearl. It has been published already almost 20 years ago. And if you go to Abu Dhabi, you can stay in the hotel and the, you can see the pearl. If you want to take me, I go. Another one, this is on Peru. Uh, most people don't know this monstrance. Monstrance is something that in Portuguese we, we say ostensorio or custodia, which is to hold the uh, holy host, the holy sacrament. This one is absolutely huge. And when you see the aura, it's all filled with pearls. And let's remember that, I mean, the oldest pearls on record are actually from Mexico. 
And when the Europeans got to the Americas, they were fascinated about the pearls, and not only in Panama, in Venezuela, and later on in Baja California, today it's Mexico. So it's a very rich pearl producing area. It was much more uh, 400 years ago. And this not only is this monstrance filled with natural pearls, it does have a huge, huge, probably a blister that you can see here um, in this, uh, this fantastic sculpture taking advantage of the Baroque shape of this pearl. So this is, this is quite a not very well known. It's from the La Merced del Cusco uh, in Peru. If you are from Peru, go there and visit. If you are not from Peru, take me and I, we go visit. So antique, let me check the time. We still have a few minutes. So antique pearls at auction. Uh, of course, some of you that follow Bonhams or Chris's and Sotheby's auctions, you come across some fantastic pearls. And let's talk about one of the, probably the most famous pair of pearls ever because of its quality, the Mancini pearls. Um, it's called the Mancini pearls, not because of this gentleman. Of course, this is Cardinal Mazzarino or Ma Mazarin. He was a very known diamond collector um, from the 17th century. And he had a niece and the niece, here, here she is, she fell in love uh, with the king of France, with Louis, and the, but she couldn't marry him because the, uh, the, it was not allowed for them to, to date, to, to, to be in love. So she was miserable for life. And uh, the king, because he also liked her very much, he offered her what was considered one of the finest a pair of pearls ever on record, and we are talking a few centuries ago. And those pearls are the Mancini, really famous Mancini pearls. They went for auction in 1969, um, like 20 years before uh, I was born, for $18,000. And uh, 10 years later, it was a quarter of a million. And I wouldn't imagine now if they are in good conditions and because they have provenance, um, I have no idea how much, but they were considered really the highest quality and they are 50 carats each and the, the shape and the nacre, it's uh, according to whoever saw them live, it's not my case. They were really astonishing. If we go a little bit back, do you see this painting? You see the painting of uh, Maria Mancini with a glass or a cup, and then dropping the pearl on that. Some of you, you know the story, and Adi Alfardan, uh, he told this story on our webinar like three, four, five weeks ago. And this is Cleopatra. She's representing and impersonating Cleopatra. Wendy had this uh, wedger with uh, Mark Antony, her lover, saying that they had like this, who can make the most lavish, most expensive feast in the world? And they began a competition. And of course, um, she had to win. And uh, the way she had to win was, she picked up a pearl and dropped it. And this is the story, the, how the story goes, the once upon a time kind of story. She dipped the pearl in vinegar and then allegedly she drank it. I have my doubts because uh, maybe uh, if we you know Asterix uh, comics, she had slaves to taste things for her. So maybe she had somebody uh, drink the, the vinegar with the pearl in it. And, uh, but this is how the story goes. And um, we cannot understand why the hell um, she did that because she had a pair of pearls and she dipped one of the most valuable pearls in, in, on, on her period just to make, uh, just to make a, a stance. But um, I mean, that, that's how it is. Curiously, on the morning webinar, we had this information that this, um, this experiment was replicated and it took approximately 48 hours to dissolve a pearl in vinegar. So maybe she was on the party waiting and waiting and waiting and eventually she was dying of thirst after two days that she had to drink it. But anyway, this is only a story. But if you look at this, why did Maria Mancini was represented as Cleopatra? Because it was fashionable and many other ladies 
were actually represented as Cleopatra. And you see here again, pearl and vinegar, pearl and vinegar, okay? Again, not yet, but she's taking the pearl off and eventually she will put it on vinegar. And this is probably one of the most famous portraits, the uh, Cleopatra banquet, where again, you see a pearl and you see a glass or a cup. And this was, and you, I could show you uh, many, many more examples. Um, this was quite typical, all of it because of Cleopatra and Mark Antony that we see here with Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. We will come to those two guys a bit later. But now let's focus on a really famous necklace uh, we'll, with a real royal provenance. Um, it's, it's, uh, no, usually it's called the uh, Queen of Sweden and Norway pearl necklace, but it was actually, it, it belonged actually to, the, to uh, Josephine Boagne, uh, that was uh, the, the consort of France, Emperor of the French, and uh, she gave it to, um, to, um, to this lady, Princess Augusta Amaria of Bavaria, and the pearls are the same. And she was a Beauharnais as a Josephine. And normally the Beauharnais, they, are, they were really, the men and the women, they were absolutely beautiful. And eventually this necklace ended up with Josephine of Sweden and Norway. And it was presented on auction not that long ago. And the, the pearls were all studied. And of all those uh, Salter pearls, only one is actually uh, a freshwater natural pearl along, it's one of the uh, 104 pearls on the strand is actually a freshwater, but all the others are saltwater. And some of the biggest ones are quite considerably large. And this necklace is attributed to Marie-Etienne Mito. He is the founder of Chaumet, although the word Chaumet, the brand, it was only a later name, but it all began with Imperial France in the late 18th century, uh, early 19th. One of the last times that this necklace was seen on publicly being worn by a lady was uh, not that long ago by Countess Gertie uh, Bernardotte. And uh, this was before um, the sale uh, that took place on Christie's in 1995. But in 2014, this, uh, this fabulous necklace with great royal provenance was sold and um, it was a 3.4 million dollars for this necklace. A couple of years later it was seen at Tefaf in Maastricht at the Symbolic and Chase stand and not that long ago it was again seen in Bahrain at the Four Seasons um, in Bahrain uh, at, the, at the Magnificent Pearl exhibition organized by Danat and also by Christie's and curiously when you look at the necklace, instead of being a two strand, it's only a long necklace. Go figure why it's displayed like that. But the beautiful thing about jewelry is you can display it however you wish. Another absolutely famous necklace that made the headlines and it was at auction is the Baroda pearl necklace. You can see here the Maharaja of Baroda. Maybe he forgot some more, uh, there is like, Oh, maybe I forgot some more pearls. That, that huge seventh strand pearls eventually resulted on the two that I'm about to show you in a couple of minutes, which is not minutes, seconds, which is this one. And if you notice, and if you look carefully, look at the shape of those pearls. We are used to think that pearls are round. This is because in our visual experience, we see mostly cultured pearls. Uh, that they have a bead, a spherical bead inside, but particularly the Akoya cultured pearls from Japan or even China. And we are used to see them as spheres, as spherical. But natural pearls, they don't have a, a bead, a round bead inside. So it's everything it grows organically. And so to have such a consistency of pearls of the same color, of the same kind of high luster, of the same shape, almost spherical or, or near spherical, the same surface quality and the same orient, the same iridescence. It's really hard to gather 68 pearls graduated from almost 10 millimeters up to 16 millimeters. And the, if this is hard for cultured pearls, imagine for 
natural pearls. This is maybe why, along with provenance, that this necklace sold in 2007 for a little over $7 million. And that's the price of a really fantastic natural pearl necklace. It's really expensive. But it's possible to say the word Baroda with pearls and forgetting the Baroda carpets and canopies. I'm going just to illustrate the canopy. It's an um, it's absolutely amazing 19th century canopy, one meter 20 in, uh, in, um, in diameter. It has almost one million natural seed pearls, as you can see here on this magnified image, along with, uh, with the glass beads, of course. But it's really large. And um, it was sold also not that long ago for almost, I think, $2 million. There is a bigger one, which is not a canopy, it's a carpet, with 2.5 2, 2, 2 million beads. Uh, 1.5 million of those beads are natural pearls also have 2,500 diamonds, and it's a crazy carpet, but this is the canopy, not the carpet itself. On the Mughal and Magnificence auction, we did witness the, the, the appreciation that the Mughal emperors and the court had for pearls. And we see pearls with, uh, pearls with uh, emeralds, pearls with spinels that were called balas, or balas rubies, if you wish. And you see a lot of paintings with pearls being represented. So pearls were really, really important for the Mughal dynasty in, in Mughal art. And for all that matter, also, also for Maharajas. And here we arrive to probably one of the most famous pearls of all times. The La Peregrina pearl or La Perla Peregrina. How do you say? There is also Peregrina, so don't make any confusion. This is the Peregrina. It's about 50 carats pear shape, perfect pear shape. It's a saltwater pearl, presumably from a Pintata Mazatlanica shell from, we think, not we, I don't think, but the scientists think from Panama. So it, but it's almost certainly from Mesoamerica, from that area. And it came to Europe in the 1580s, mark that date, in the 1580s, and he's, and the first owner, was this gentleman, Philip II of Spain, that was also, by the way, Philip I of Portugal. Um, so the pearl belonged to a Portuguese king. I mean, he was Spanish, but he was also Portuguese. It's a, it's a mess. It's a confusion. But then, the, the, as you see, the provenance is absolutely royal. And on the literature, and uh, God forbid, not on the internet, but if you want to find information, avoid the internet, go to the... To, read books, uh, but on, even on the books, you see that sometimes this pearl is attributed to Mary Tudor. Mary Tudor, she was married to Philip II. They were both really very young. Now it would be a crime, but 500 years ago was different. And, uh, but the lady, she passed away in the 1550s and the pearl arrived in Spain in the 1580s. So it, it is impossible that the pearl belong to Mary Tudor, even, even if on a painting that it was painted in the 1550s, she is wearing a pearl that looks similar to the Peregrina. So not only, and in look at her face, she is doing that expression saying, this is not a Peregrina. Can't you see? So uh, this is an, an anachronism. And it's really easy to demonstrate because she died in the 1550s and then the Peregrina arrived in Spain in the 1580s. End of story. Really, really uh, easy to, to, to say. Anne Marie Jordan, she's a, a jewelry historian. She published for Symbolic and Chase, I think in 2013 or 14, I have no idea, I can remember, a book precisely on that pearl that you see on Mary Tudor's painting that is called the Mary Tudor Pearl. It belongs to Isabella of Portugal. Isabella, she was daughter of uh, King Manuel I, and she was married to Emperor Charles V, a very powerful lady. And she gave the pearl to Mary Tudor. So this pearl that you see on the screen is not a peregrina, totally different, but in similar shape. But this one is the Mary Tudor Pearl. It was last seen at the Bolic and
So make no mistake, peregrina, no meritudor. Peregrina, no meritudor, in my best English. And so, why the, 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 the picture we see here um, Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton in, impersonating Cleopatra and Mark Antony. On, on the Valentine's Day, Richard, he loved uh, offering Elizabeth jewelry for birthday, Valentine's Day, whatever. And on the Valentine's Day, he bought a peregrine pearl for $37,000 um, and gave it to her. And not that after, not that long after, she commissioned Cartier to do this necklace with the diamonds, rubies, and some natural and cultural pearls all together. And this necklace became really, really famous. And as most of you know, uh, in 2011, she show, uh, uh, the estate of Elizabeth Taylor was sold at auction and the, the pearl necklace or the peregrine necklace came to, um, to, uh, to the auction with an estimate of one to two million dollars and it sold for 10 times more, 11 million dollars. That story maybe you know. What maybe you don't know is when she got the pearl, she had a poodle or a couple of poodles, poodles like a dog. And um, she eventually, not, not that long after, I think it was on the same day or the day after she got the pearl from Richard Burton, she, the pearl was missing. I mean, the most famous pearl in history was missing. She didn't know where, where, where the pearl was. And then she looked at the poodle and the poodle was like having fun with, with his teeth. And when she opened the mouth of the poodle, <laughs> there was the pearl. And she was like, what? Of course, the pearl was a little bit damaged, but she was lucky because five minutes later, no pearl, maybe no poodle after that anyway. And um, so it was good for everyone. And she got the pearl and the pearl had like a little damage. And uh, she contacted people that she knew on the industry. And that gentleman, he knew John Latendris. John Latendris, he's a legend in the United States. He was running the American Pearl Company since the 60s. He was a shell producer uh, to, to export to Japan for the cultural pearl industry, but also a producer of the first American cultured pearl in Tennessee. So he is an American legend in the pearl industry. And he was really experienced in pearls. And Gina Latendris, she remembers, Gina is, is uh, John's daughter. She remembers her father telling the story that he had to, he received the pearl and he immediately recognized it. <gasps> That's the peregrina. And uh, he fixed the damage. And uh, People that fix surface damage in pearls, they are called pearl doctors. That's the technical term. And he, with a really very skilled hands of experience working with pearls, he was able to peel and to, to work with the layers of nacre to disguise as much as possible the um, damage that the little poodle made to the famous pearl. So eventually, that's the story that most people don't know. And Gary Roskin, he, now he's the general director of uh, ICA. He published this story like 10 years ago. So it's published, it's in there on the internet. But I mean, I, I hate the internet, but this one is not on a book. And now, look at the lady, another really famous lady. Some of you know, she's Austrian. She was also Queen of France and she lost her head. It's Marie Antoinette. The estate, not the estate, but some jewels from the Marie Antoinette a heritage were sold quite recently at auction and at Sotheby's, Geneva. And we had this necklace and this necklace was sold by over $2 million. And by the way, look at the shape of the pearls. They are not absolutely round, are they? Like the Baroda ones, but those nevertheless are quite pearl. And there was even more exquisite pearl, pear shape, and that belonged to Marie Antoinette, quite long one, 25 millimeters in length. The estimate was one to $2 million as the uh, um, peregrine pearl. And eventually this pearl sold for $36 million. Like uh, with $36 million, I can buy a car, maybe. A car in the moon, <laughs> anyway. And uh, 
but this is astonishing for a pearl. It's a world record for a pearl, of course, provenance as Marie Antoinette made a difference. And this pearl and the pearl necklace, they were seen in public not that long ago in Heidi Goss Wharton um, garment. You look at the necklace, that's Marie Antoinette necklace. Look at the pearl, that's the Marie Antoinette pearl. So almost $40 million like this. And I don't, I'm not sure, but look at the ring. That ruby looks like the sunrise ruby, $30 million. So give it or take the earrings, the emerald, maybe $100 million walking. Uh, Mrs. Heidi Van Horten. She's a lovely collector. So it's a walking bank. So pearls with stories. I'm, I've, I've been telling you stories about pearls and let me check the time. I have five more minutes to rush so I don't have so much time. Uh, the Medici Hanover pearls. It's a fascinating story. If you are from the UK, maybe you know this story because it has a lot to do with Britain and with, with the history of Elizabeth I and uh, also Queen Victoria. And there was a Pope, Clement VII, he was a Medici. And by the way, for those that like um, gemology and medicine, he died after eating a few spoons of diamond powder. So he became famous. I knew Clement VII because of that story, because he ate some powder. Maybe the maybe diamonds were did. But anyway. Um, he had a niece, uh, the popes had a lot of nieces, and um, Catherine of Medici, and she was marrying Henry of France, and upon her marriage, the pope offered her like a hugely, richly lavish collection of pearls, ropes, and also pear-shaped huge pearls, it was a crazy amount of pearls in great quality that she wore really proudly. And when later on, she offered some of those pearls to Mary Stuart, the Queen of Scots, her daughter-in-law. And um, she was, I mean, the Queen of Scots, she had a, a dreadful life, poor lady. She was really unlucky. I mean, she was really lucky to get the pearls, but her private life was a mess. And um, after many unfortunate things, Mary uh, Stuart pearls ended up with Queen Elizabeth, uh, that was the first Protestant queen in, in Europe. And you see here Queen Elizabeth I using the ropes of pearls. And if you count them, there are 24 pear-shaped pearls, really large size. And all of those pearls are the Medici pearls. And um, she was a brilliant politician. And even this picture is a political statement. She is a Protestant queen using the pearls of a Catholic Pope. And that on those days, it meant something. And by the way, just to irritate the Spanish, this is the, the English Armada and this is the Spanish Armada. So this is all political, uh, this painting, but quite curious. But what I want to say is, these pearls then were passed on from queen to queen uh, uh, around Europe and ended up in the Hanover dynasty, in the Hanover house. And Queen Victoria, she was a Hanover, so she was basically German. And uh, by some Hanover, she was supposed upon the death of her father to return the jewelry to Germany, and she didn't, uh, particularly the Hanover pearls. And there was a court case, but she kept the pearls and she made it uh, uh, Britain's treasury, like, like the state's uh, treasury. Um, and this is how they started to be called the Hanover pearls instead of the Medici pearls. And if you want to see the Hanover pearls, you go to the opening of the parliament, you ask um, uh, Queen Elizabeth, can you please stop? And you can look at the uh, top of the crown of the imperial state crown Try not to be dazzled about the, uh, the spinel, the black prince ruby, or the cullinum diamond, but try to focus on those four drops. And those four drops are what is left from those 24 Medici pearls that Queen Elizabeth used to wear on her hair. 
And also, the ropes from those ropes, Queen Elizabeth II, she gathered, eventually those, there was a, an immensely amount of pearls that, of course, it was reduced over time. And on very special occasions, she uses the Medici Hanover pearls, which, by the way, on this picture is the row, this, this is the second row that you see on the picture. Um, and this picture was taken in 2013, if my memory doesn't fail me. And um, she only uses it on very, very occasion, very special occasions, because politically and historically, those pearls, I mean, they have a huge historical significance, probably much more than the Cullinan diamond or the Black Prince Ruby. Last, then this is the last story I'm going to tell you today, is the Mary Plant's pearl necklace. If you, are, if you know Cartier history, you know this story. If you don't know, you will get to know this story. So Mary Plant, she was a typical high-class lady living in New York, married to a millionaire. And when Cartier opened its uh, store in New York, organized events and Mary Plant, my plant, she went to Cartier to be entertained and to look at jewelry. And she saw these two strand of absolutely perfect oriental natural pearls that you see here on this portrait, that if, uh, if you go to New York to Cartier in Fifth Avenue, you see this painting when you, when you enter the uh, store. But she saw this necklace, she came home and said to the husband, Oh, darling, I just saw a, a nice pearl strand at Cartier. Can I buy? And he said, oh, but of course, you go, go ahead and buy. And by the way, how much does it cost? And she said, um, it's, it's a million dollars. And he said, I have no idea what he said, but I can imagine. And he said, no, no way. And this is, uh, I think it's a quote, which is uh, actually truth. He said that no pearl strand could cost one million dollars and if we must go back 100 years one million dollars today is a lot of money imagine 100 years from now or not from now in the past it's crazy amount of it's 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 astronomical it's crazy but i mean she had her charms and she convinced the husband to to spend and to buy the necklace but he didn't want to, to pay cash he wanted to make a business. And they, the family, the, they wanted to move uptown in New York and they wanted to get rid of the estate of the house, uh, the five-story house they had in Manhattan. And so they proposed to Cartier to say, okay, I give you my house, uh, which is a nice one, and uh, I give you $100 and you give me the necklace. Cartier said, fine, of course. Now you go to New York, and this is the absolutely astronomically higher priced headquarters of Cartier in America that I, I'm not a real estate expert, but I mean, this was worth a pearl necklace 100 years ago. And uh, when you go into this, this is Fifth Avenue, but if you go on this one, you can see, you, can see, you, go, you go in and you see the painting, which is quite amusing to see. Go there. And uh, if you want company, you just call me, I go with you, no problem. Interestingly, when she passed away in, in uh, 1956, her estate was sold and the pearls, they went for auction at the Park Barnett Galleries, also in New York. And the, the necklace was separated in two necklaces, which is a shame, but that's what they did. And they were sold. And the amount of money that those oriental pearls, and by the way, she was not Mayplant anymore. She was Miss John Rovensky. And the, the amount of money that could be gathered by those two necklaces was a fraction of the cost in the early century. This has a lot of reasons, maybe because <clears throat> at this time in the mid-50s, cultural pearls were booming. And so the... Uh, the appreciation for natural pearls was not as high as it used to be on the Belle Epoque and in the beginning of the 20th century. But I'm sure that if those necklaces were sold today, the price would be astronomical as well, much more than a million dollars. I can bet. Uh, I can bet my. I can bet my books on it. So we could be here forever talking about tiaras 
pearl tiaras, I didn't mention even one. And there are so many that I could have mentioned and I didn't. And, uh, but this, this just, this used to be uh, a property of Isabelle de Orléans. She was the Countess of Paris. She was also a Braganza, so she was related to the Portuguese or Brazilian imperial family. So, but I could have chosen a lot of tiaras to illustrate the use of pearls and I didn't. And many other pearls were not covered on this webinar. So, and even the, uh, the uh, girl with the pearl earring by um, Vermeer, and I just saw the other day a documentary saying that the pearl actually, maybe it's not a pearl, but uh, I'm a gemologist. I can tell if I see if I see the artifact from a painting, I have no idea, but the experts in painting, they told that maybe that pearl is not a pearl at all. Go figure. So thank you very much. And this is it. I have to unshare my screen. And now it's the part that you are clapping like crazy. <laughs> so there you go, Edward, I need some water now. You take a break, young man, you take a break. And uh, I'm gonna just fill you in, Rui, because you're talking and entertaining so many people for all this time, you don't get to read what's going on in the chat. And there's no. been some wonderful conversations going on in the chat. I'm just gonna share some of them with you. Okay, we, had, good. We, we had a great comment from Kate Pierce that she thought that the sleeping lion pearl, remember that? It, it looks like Jabba the Hutt. I think that was a it was a great comment. I like that. Thank you, it Kate. It does. It does. That's great. I, I, maybe I, yeah, it's just Jabba the Hutt. Absolutely. It is. And and you know what? I, we've both been to many presentations around the world and, and conferences on gemology, but that is absolutely the first time today when I had gemology married together with asterisk and obelix. Thank you very much. Two of my great <laughs> loves. I really appreciated that. And other people like that as well. So that, that was great. Um, uh, Suzanne, Suzanne had a great uh, post where she said she's done the experiment of uh, dissolving pearls in liquid. What she did, she said she, she, she I, I assume she ground them down into a sort of a flower or farine um, and then put them in a sort of champagne. And it just produced lots of bubbles. Oh, no nice. Difference. No difference to the taste at all, but she said it was an exciting project. So I, I, that's I, I'm, I'm calling Heidi Van Horten to do that with the Marie Antoinette. Pearl, yes, right? yeah. They, we, yeah, th this is not advised to do with some valuable pearls, all right, ladies and gentlemen, but please, if you have low, low value ones. We also had a lovely comment from Duval. Um, if, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, but she or he, I'm not sure, uh, said, it's a they 21st were at, century, we don't know. That's it. They were at the 2011 uh, Christie's auction of La Pellegrina. So um, you oh. know, almost $12 million the purchase. So I'm wondering if Duvel was the buyer, the purchaser. Please get back to us, Duvel. Yes, um, that so, would be lovely to know. And I've never, um, I've never been on, uh, on any world-class auction. I've been in auctions in Portugal. And I, I've been and, and, uh, in, the, in the previous, in the previews, not at the, uh, not at the auction itself, at Christie's and Sotheby's, but uh, I imagine the, uh, the emotion uh, that one can feel inside the room when certain historical items are for sale. And I cannot imagine how was the bidding for the Marie Antoinette Pearl that went up to $36 million. Uh, not Absolutely. that long ago. And again, the same with uh, uh, Elizabeth Taylor's $11 million Peregrina. That we knew, we learned today that it was worked. So it was spilled by, uh, by a legend, John Latendris, but still it was a, 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 a worked, if you wish, treated pearl. So I, 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 are you calm and relaxed enough now for three for me to throw some of the questions in the Q and A? Of course, you? but easy so ones, please. I'm only going to choose the ones that I know you can answer. Right? So oh, that's that's just, brilliant. Thank you very much. Point. Um, I'm going to I'm going to start here with one from um, Brian Swoboda. Brian, a very famous uh, mineral guy. So nice to have you with us, Brian. Um, 
he, 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 comments, he, he commends you on your explanation between a pearl and a blister, but he asks, how does the pearl sac itself form? Because if the blister is formed uh, as a way that the mollusk clears and, and, and coats the irritant, what's the catalyst for the pearl sac itself to form? What triggers a pearl sac? I, I don't, honestly, I don't know the biological answer. But the, technically, the, if there is some irritation on the mantle, and even in other parts of the animal, because people might not know that you can find pearls not only on the mantle, which is like the, that long, uh, how do you say it, which is a long carpet covering the shell, but you can also find pearls on the ab abductor muscle, you can find pearls on the gonads. You can find pearls in many parts of the animal, not only on the mantle, where we think that the um, nacre-producing cells are located. What might trigger it, it's like an irritation. It can be a material irritation, a physical irritation, or a chemical or biological irritation. And all of a sudden, I presume, but I'm not, I'm speculating, that the cells, they start to invaginate, which is, a, I know it's in English, invagination, that's the name in Portuguese, that starts to, to cover the irritation and that's it. But I, I don't know the, the biological trigger, the physiological trigger of a natural uh, pearl sac. I have no response for that. But um, I don't know if Stefanos Karempelas is, if he's on the room, he might uh, know the answer. I know we'll that- have a look. Professor we'll have a look. Henry, Sorry, Professor Henry Haney, he, he, he wrote like 15 years ago, uh, a remarkable article about, um, about natural pearl formation. Uh, and uh, he was uh, again discussing triggering, but the triggering is not a, grand, a grain of sand. That thing that we think, oh, that's a grain of sand, I mean, if you, if, you, uh, if you had clams in your life, you know that some mollusks, they are full of sand if, when you eat them. So sand, if they, depending on the substrate, if they live on, on the sandy substrate, sand is all over. So sand is not making the, uh, is not making the trigger. It's a, either a biological or a mechanical uh, an irritant. Yeah, and that's great that you bring that up um, because that does lead to a couple of the questions that we had, which is... And by the way, let what? me interrupt, let me interrupt uh, uh, just a little yeah. bit, Edward. If that one is that kind of question that you know that I can answer, I imagine what is next. <laughs> well, I, I didn't do well with the first one, did I? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to another one now. But I, no, it doesn't I, I, matter. You can throw any question on me. I, I, don't I think you're going you're, you're gonna to know this one. This is okay. Honestly. But people are asking, what are the types of foreign bodies that we know enter the shell? The grain of sand thing is not true. But what are the types of foreign bodies that enter usually, the shell? Go for yeah, it. Usually what we see in the literature are parasites. There are lots of parasites. Uh, so they are, they, they are little animals. And uh, usually it's parasites. Uh, I don't know the name of any parasite. I can name a few. Uh, yeah. <laughs> parasites, but not, not the parasites that trigger pearl formation. Let's not go there. Okay. Um, we do have also, uh, Daniela has asked a question about can pearls be shaped? And I think what she means by that is can they be faceted? We're used to faceting gemstones, but can, can pearls be faceted? I don't know what, she's, what, 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 what she means. Uh, you have sometimes, you, when you have a blister pearl, a natural blister pearl, you have to remove it from the shell and you can reshape some part of the, of, of the pearl. I don't know if that's what she's, what she's mentioning. Also, the, 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 what is called working, which is um, try, trying to reshape the, the stone also, also happens. You have the faceting uh, that started in Japan like 30 years ago, I think. Yeah, probably the Komatsu diamond cutting factory. Exactly. And even Viktor Tuzlukov, he made a remarkable sculpture uh, on a Tahitian culture pearl. But you also have um, some imitate, not imitations, when you have a mellow pearl, a non nacreous pearl. And if you want to give it a more desirable round look, you can shape it. But of course, if you are experienced pearl 
tester, which is not my case, um, then you have Nick Sturman, you have Stefanos, you have Ken Scarrett, they can look at the pearl and uh, with proper tests and equipment and experience, and they can tell if the pearl was shaped. I don't know if that's the uh, if that that was the answer, if the, if that was the question. It works for me. It works for me, Good. and I, I I very much also hope that it works for Daniela too. So, uh, by the way, Hannah McWhorter is saying here, thank you very much for these webinars, and she says she'll miss them when she goes back to work. As we said at the beginning, it's really great that people are going back to work. We know that people will have less time to join your wonderful webinars, but please still continue joining even when you are working, because then you can use this wonderful knowledge to help you in your job selling beautiful gems and jewelry. Yeah, and that, that, that's actually a good point. And Edward, as you know, I do a lot of social media, right? I do Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. And I basically, I post really simple things every business day. And the purpose is actually to give some tools to salespeople uh, so they can first get inspired and love the products that they are selling for all of us. Because if I have a job and if you had, if you work in gemstones, if every one of you work in gemstones, it's because we have retailers that sell jewelry and they pay all the bills upstream up until the mining guys and the mining communities. And so um, those, those texts are to inspire, but also to give a few sales tips. But, but mostly it's to inspire because I'm passionate about this and I love writing. And you're absolutely right. Education sells. It's the best way to sell at the sales counter is to tell people stories and to educate them. That's the best way every time. But let me make you a comparison uh, because I had this already. On, I, I used to sell... I, I, I'm, I was never a stone seller, but when I was really young with no money, I had to finance my own gemstone collection. And so I used to travel to Tucson when I met you. And I usually bought like five to 10 stones. I would keep the two best ones, gemologically speaking, not necessarily the cleanest ones. And I would sell the other three, four or five that remained so I could pay for the trip and to pay for the, uh, for the collection. But I was terrible in selling because some of was selling to the mall, he would understand the actual interest of the material. But if people like a lady that wanted to do a ring with that kind of ruby or emerald or sapphire or topaz, I would bombard her with technical stuff that she would lose the passion automatically. Like when we meet um, a lady, uh, if we know everything about the lady, Oh, we know we don't want, but of course, if if there is mystery, we want to know more, and that's passion. So, and you're right, and that's yeah. that's so important. I mean, we we all know from having watched you over the past couple of months that you're not short of a word or two, Rui. So you know, we know you can talk a lot, and of course, there is a point in a sales process when you have to stop talking and get out the credit card machine. Sometimes, yeah. so, um, we have a we have a question from Louisa. Our friend Louisa from from the museum. Um, oh, a problem. couple of either. Hi, Louisa. Great to have you with us again. But um, she, I can't pronounce her surname. Penalva. 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 Okay. It stands she, for white rock. Okay. Pen. It's Pena. It's a rock. Alva means white. I think Louisa. I think your name stands for white rock. Okay, well, Louisa will tell us if it's not. So, um, but she asks, and a couple of other people ask, what's the best way to look after pearls, to care for them? Uh, there are some things that you should avoid. For instance, to keep them in cotton, never. Um, um, you should avoid uh, thermal shock. You should avoid any chemical whatsoever, particularly acids. And even uh, we have people that have different acid skins, right? If you have a, a high uric acid levels on your blood, maybe your sweat is a little bit more acid than the regular. So if you are using pearls, eventually they will be degraded by the acid of your skin. Never use vinegar, Coca-Cola or lemon juice, or if you are cooking, put your old jewelry away. Go don't go, don't, don't stay on, at the sun with those 
with those pearls, particularly if they are drilled and go, don't go to the sea with them and don't, don't, don't dive with your, with your pearl jewelry. And um, they are soft, so avoid uh, storing your pearl jewelry along with diamond jewelry and other gemstone jewelry and uh, keep them away from very dry environments. In the best jewelry shops, sometimes you see on the window a little nice glass of water. Just, it, it's a sales tool because if you see a glass of water, you can start a conversation. Why the hell is the glass of water there? But then you can start uh, explaining how you should care for pearls and never have a, um, a very dry environment because uh, pearls also have water in their composition. And if you have a very, very dry environment, that water goes away. And it happens the, the, the same as with our skin. If you have a very dry skin, wrinkles and things start emerging. Not emerging. Yes, start emerging. So avoid that kind of thing. That's why never use cotton or absorbing tissues when storing pearls. A, a, a plastic bag is great for pearls, actually. It's not beautiful, and, but it's great. And actually, Kate Pierce, who, who, who brought Jabba the Hutt into the conversation, brings up the great saying, which is pearls, last thing on, first thing off, which is always great advice for looking at. It's off. a very good line. Very yeah. good. Yes. Yeah, I never thought about that. I've... We've, also got, um, we've also got quite a lot of questions about um, advice for what books you would recommend. Now... I, I, this might be that people want to know what books are good, but it might also be that people just want to see your bottom. Oh, so I have to put my trousers. Uh, not today. So, yeah. <laughs> so let me see if I can stand up. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to stand up. I'm going to fetch my, my poor books. Let me see. I have a lot of wires. Ah, there you so go. now you, there you uh, go. now you can enjoy. Now you can enjoy. <laughs> so there is one. There is the other one, and I do have here this one, this one, and this one. And by the way, this one as well. So people are pleased you're wearing pants, Rui. Yeah, today I'm lucky enough. Yes, yes. And today it's Thursday, so it, it was bathing. It's pants day. day. Pants day. Yeah. It's Wednesday. Oh, so I didn't need to, to bath, to go to shower. So this one is, I would say, the Bible for, for pearls. It's quite technical. It's for, by Elizabeth Strack. It's a really, really good book if you want to learn about pearls. And it's good for exercise. Quite thick. And... This is a 1908 book by George Frederick Kunz and, and Stevenson. And this is a Dover Publications edition. It's quite affordable if uh, maybe, okay. Maybe yeah. now you can see. It's the yeah, book of the pearls. That's good. Okay, and it's, uh, it's a lovely text and it has a lot, not that many images, but there's a lot of text. And uh, by the way, if, uh, uh, when I told you about the American, the Native Americans using pearls, he also discussed a lot of natural pearls uh, in the US, particularly <coughs> in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Great book. If you want to buy a first edition, you should uh, save a few thousands of dollars. It's quite expensive, but it's a beautiful book. By the way, this was a catalog of an exhibition at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And um, curated by, curated by, I don't have my glasses on, so I cannot read it anyway. It's a lovely book, well illustrated, with really well researched. And uh, if we are talking about exhibitions, I must show you a little book by uh, Hubert Barry. Uh, Hubert Barry and uh, Beatrice Chandour Samson. I have no idea where Beatrice is from. I know that Hubert is. Uh, French speaking, so it's Hubert. Beatrice, I have no idea where you are from. So this is a, a, a book from a, another exhibition curated by Hubert Barry. By the way, he also curated 
the diamond exhibition in, in the Natural History Museum in Paris. And that's when I met him. He's a, he's a very hardworking man, really knowledgeable, quite smart. And um, he has a bigger publication that I didn't grab my hands on that one yet. I will eventually, and, or I can give you my address and you can send me. And um, this is a great pearl. La Perle Rose, it's in French. I don't know in what languages it's, it, is it published. It's from Skira. It's a great, great publication. It's about not nacreous pearls, but about conch pearl. And by the way, ho hold on a second. I'm going to fetch another one on, sorry, on conch pearls. Uh, this one, this one is good. Oh, somebody has just said, by the way, Rui, somebody, Peter has said that Hubert Barry is from Luxembourg. I always thought he was French. Oh, that's fascinating. I mean, he's French definitely speech. French speaking. I mean, now we know that he probably speaks Flemish as well. But um, okay, with non nacreous pearls, we also have uh, this one, which is a, a, a very limited edition of a conch pearl a collection, uh, if you know. And of course, you have here, edited by Derek Content, the Pearl and the Dragon, about yeah. Mellow. Pearls, mm. not nacreous mellow pearls. And because you worked uh, at GIA for so much long, I leave the GIA Pearl book to the end. So, and this was published uh, not that long ago, and it's absolutely love, lovely photographies. It's by Robert Weldon and, um, and Donna Dearlam. Uh, Robert Weldon now runs a library, the Richard T. Lyrical Library, and uh, Donna, she used to run the library. The, the, he has the best profession ever. I mean, he works on the best library in the world and he's surrounded with books and nice pictures. I and mean, he's a really nice man. And he, they published this really nice book about that long ago. And just hold it up for a second as well while you're talking about it. Just hold that, uh, the Robert Weldon and Donna book up again because I don't know if people have seen this cover before, but that pair of earrings, quite a wonderful piece. It's by Anil Malu from Baggins Limited, a really well-known pearl supplier in the US, but graduated colors and sizes inside a beautiful metal uh, encasing. Just a gorgeous pair of pearls, real statement piece. Oh, uh, it, it is. <laughs> Do you know Anil what? Malu, all right, he's I'm... a great pearl dealer in the States and his company is named Baggins. And I I'm asked him to... once why, and it is because he's a great fan of The Hobbit. So there you go, that's why he's called his company Baggins. I, I'm going to be really honest. I never, usually when, when I get a book, I go, I go, like the kids, I go directly inside to, to read it. And sometimes I overlook the cover and I never, I never looked at that cover, honestly. Well, you, you can't start reading them now, Rui. You're broadcasting to 268 people. So don't just sit Still? back on your sofa and start reading. Oh, where are the other thousands? They, they <laughs> run away when I stood up, right? They, they had to go for dinner, sorry. They said goodbye. And we still have, a, a not that long, we still have like uh, two, three or four minutes. If there is some other questions, let me see if I can find an, a, an easy one. Okay. Oh, Luis Epnalvas is asking, what about Baroque pearls? Mm. Uh, the name Baroque stands for type of shape. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't mean if the pearl is natural or cultured, if it is fresh water or salt water, it does only mean that that particular pearl doesn't have an axis of symmetry. And that's what Baroque means. I think it's actually a Portuguese word uh, that stands for non-symmetry. And it's a, it's, a word, it's a word that is used in the pearl industry for non-symmetrical pearls. And regardless of their natural cultured freshwater or saltwater origin. I'm just posting in the chat um, some links that'll be useful regarding this webinar and regarding um, pearls. So hopefully that'll be helpful. Some people are asking for a list of the books that you recommended. Um, maybe we'll try to see what we can do about that later. I, I can recommend even better. Uh, if you log into GIA library website, uh, Jim Shigley has been collecting 
Um, that's for historical pearls, but I mean, in the GIA library website, try to explore it as much as you can. It's a fantastic website with a lot of resources. And one of the resources is historical bibliography on particular gem materials, including pearls. And you can find there a lot of resources for pearls. And I strongly recommend looking at the James Shigley list and other, uh, other resources at the GIA library instead of um, looking into my books that are, they are only the ones that I can afford and uh, that I, I really enjoy. There is another one that was really recently released uh, um, uh, written by Shigeru Akamatsu. He was a senior uh, executive at Mikimoto in Japan, and he's a pearl expert, uh, world-renowned pearl expert, and he wrote a quite comprehensive book about the Mikimoto um, biography and the, the birth of the cultural pearl industry. And it was released not that long ago. It was released in Japan like a few years ago, and it was finally translated into English. And um, there are so many resources that strongly recommend uh, GIA Library, or if you don't want to go to the website, if you have a Journal of Gemology or a Gems and Gemology magazine or a Facet from SSCF magazine, you look into the Pearl articles and you scroll up until the end and you see the references. And then on the references, you see so many resources that then you will become like me. You have books all over and you will be poor, but you will start comfortably. Yes, but when they start running webinars and podcasting thing, people will think that they're really intelligent because they've got loads of books behind yes, them. Yes, exactly. <laughs> actually, actually, those are green screens. Uh... Somebody here is asking, um, Julia is asking, why, and I guess how, do pearls have different colors? That has to do, it's a very interesting question. It has to do with many factors. Some have to do with uh, chemistry, with particular chemical elements that go inside the nacre, for instance. We are used to see freshwater uh, cultured pearls, and for all that matter, freshwater natural pearls, but let's focus on the freshwater cultured pearls made on the Eriopsis genus um, mussels in China and or Japan. And we, they tend to be more uh, pinkish, more mauve, more orange than than the other, than the salt water. And that has to do with the manganese content, for example. And uh, you have also not only the chemical uh, parts that can affect color, you can have, also have pigmentation, uh, organic molecules that are different. And you have different muscles with different kind of pigmentation. And you, I mean, there are so many mechanisms that cause the color. Um, that uh, it's a, it's a fa one of the most challenging things in pearl testing. It's, for example, if you get a golden pearl, if you want to know if the color is natural or not, you must know exactly what is the color mechanism so you can understand if it was dyed or if, if it was heat treated to become a golden. The same with chocolate pearls, natural chocolate pearls that they, they, you, they, they, they can be harvested in Fiji or in, in Tahiti, in the French Polynesia, they are quite rare. But there is a process, a bleaching process, a chemical process that can turn Tahitian cultured pearls into a lovely chocolate color. It was a proprietary um, um, process. It was from Ballerina Pearl Company, I think, uh, yep. many, many years ago. And um, you must know the mechanism so you can detect what is causing the color. But that's made on a laboratory. That's not, uh, you cannot use the hand lens and uh, be sure. Pearl testing is a really complex thing. And if you want to learn more about pearl testing, uh, Nick Sturman, that uh, is head of pearl services at GIA, and it looks like I have a GIA mandate to talk about them, but it, it actually it's not. But Nick, he, he gave an extraordinary webinar the other day for the GIA knowledge base, I think. You go to GIA uh, YouTube channel and you check his presentation and he presents pearls and mollusks. And he, he also discuss pearl um, identification. And if you go to Danat's uh, YouTube channel, you can see 
his presentation on Perl, on the history of Perl testing. And you can see a lot of other experts talking about Perl testing, like, um, like um, uh, what's his name? Oh, no, I forgot the name of the Greek guy, Stefanos Karimpelos. Stefanos Karimpelos. Stefanos. And I met Stefanos in GIA at Carlsbad on a, on a symposium, and he became famous because he was not very good in English at that time. And he, while, while he was presenting, he said a certain word that everybody that was in the room, uh, we remember. <laughs> so did we get a situation where we had a Portuguese guy teaching a Greek guy how to speak better English? <laughs> that's that's yeah. good. I like that. I'll go with that. I, I do have, there's a question here, which I, I think it's easy. Um, Omar, Omar Demaral, who's been listening to a lot of presentations, he comes up a lot and says, he says, what's the difference between mother of Pearl and Pearl? Are, are they the same thing or are they different? And I'm yeah, going to have to change because I'm getting a reflection of light. Excuse me. No problem. Uh, it, it's the same. Uh, the cells that produce uh, mother of pearl or nacre, if you are talking about nacre, mother of pearl, are the same that makes pearl. So they are basically the same thing. The only difference is this is mother of pearl. It's flat. And then if it is round and grown on a pearl sac, it is pearl. But it's basically the same thing. Thank you. He'll be grateful for that answer. There are some questions as well about how you tell the difference between different types of pearls. So, you know, how can you tell the difference between a freshwater and a marine pearl or a seawater pearl? That kind of things are very complex and they are something to do at the laboratory. But you have some indications, color, for example. Color can be an indication. The type of luster can be another indication. Um, the the uh, the type of of uh, nacre layers under magnification can be another indication, but that's a really complex thing. And to properly identify the pearl host, and if we are talking only natural pearls, you must do chemical analysis. So you must study the gallium the iron, the manganese, the magnesium, the barium content, the strontium content of um, that, uh, that pearl, and also do um, infrared spectroscopy for the organic molecules. And if you, have, if you have the access to DNA, you should do a DNA fingerprinting um, if you can remove a little scrap of that pearl to have some DNA material, and then you might you might get to the conclusion that that is from a pintata species or from a pteria species. I mean, some pteria species, they have a special fluorescence, a fluorescent reaction, and you can rule them out quite easily. But when we see the plethora of species that give origin to pearls, it's so huge, but so huge that it's really challenging to know exactly. And for instance, when we see a 17th century pearl necklace, those pearls can be from the Gulf. They can be from Asia. They can be from the Red Sea. They can be from the Caribbean. They can be from almost everywhere, but they are on the same strand, okay? Like a, bit, a little bit like diamonds in the 19th century. They could be from several South African mines and they were collected. Um, that's a, a consolidated mines. So it, it was the same with pearls. You didn't have uh, pearls uh, when they got into good quality, like, okay, now I only have Burmese quality pearls, or I want to have Panamian or Venezuelan quality pearls. If they were quality pearls, they were mixed up together. Um, I know that you like to uh, finish up soon, but there is yes, a question because here. the questions are really difficult. That, well, I'm, checking, I'm picking the most difficult ones just to trick you today. But... Somebody's asked you, uh, Maya, Maya, Maya has asked you if you can talk briefly on seed and cashew pearls. Oh, that's a fascinating topic. Uh, I'm really glad that you brought it up. Keshi, it's a Japanese word, okay? That's for a stall. Okay. The Japanese, when they were opening, forget about cultural pearls for now. Let's go back 200 years. No Mikimoto. 
So when the Japanese, they, they harvested a small akoya shell, the pintata fucata, that they locally, they call it akoya, akoya guy, that means the shell, akoya shell. When they saw a very small pearl, they call it a keshi. So keshi was basically synonym of a very, very small pearl. Okay. And the word uh, we, uh, in the West, we call it a seed pearl. A seed pearl technically is under two millimeters, never above three millimeters. Okay, that's the technical definition of a seed pearl. But when the culturing industry boomed in the 1920s, and when you had byproducts of the culturing grafting process, not only on the Pintata Fucata Martensi, if you wish, from Japan, the Akoyas, but also later on from the Taishian and the South Sea um, uh, pearl oysters, then you would have non-bead, which, which means beadless, without a nucleus, cultured pearl products that were really small and they were byproducts of the culturing process. And they, because they were small, particularly those in Japan from the Akoya culturing process as byproducts, because they were small, they were also called keshis, because it's a Japanese word that stands for small. Why would they call another thing? They were small pearls, but they were cultured products, not natural products. But because the word keshi was repeatedly used as a synonym of a non-bead cultured product that resulted as a byproduct of the culturing process, the word was corrupted into what is now today the trade me of a keshi pearl that basically it's a cultured product without a nucleus, without a bead, not the original meaning that was just a seed pearl. I don't know if, if I responded to the question or not. No, you did. And you did it perfectly. And, and, and I said briefly, and I actually started a stopwatch here to see what briefly meant in Rui terms. And it's, it's currently two minutes 57. So I, that's pretty brief. That's pretty good. Let me tell you, this is so, so important because the topic is not easily explained. You, you must give the context. Absolutely. Because uh, uh, I, I could just say the definitions, but... Uh, to give a, a story and a context would be much better, I think. But yes, it was uh, not, not brief. It, it, no, it was brief. I'm, I'm not being rude. <laughs> it's, very, it's very concise. It's great. Um, I know we don't really like to talk about value so much because we leave that for the traders and, and right. we're much more on the academic and the scientific. But Kate Pierce, she of the Jabba the Hut quote, has asked a really interesting question, and it's really your opinion. So you can't be right or wrong with whatever you say, right? But she asks, is size, shape, or luster more important, or provenance? So is, is the background and history of the item more important than the actual quality? I can give you an example uh, of, I think it was um, Jacqueline Kennedy's, necklace of uh, imitation pearls that sold for, I don't know if it was 9,000 or $19,000. They were imitation pearls, but they were Jacqueline Kennedy's. So provenance was everything for those pearls. If we look at the um, Marie, Marie Antoinette pearl, that kind of pearl, which is really nice, I didn't see it personally, but I, I am told that it's a quite good quality Pearl, and pearls actually have factors affecting their price, which is, as you said, luster, which is the way light is reflected from the surface, color, uh, surface quality, if it has blemishes, pits, and wrinkles, and uh, other things, shape, if it is round, if it is a pier, a button, if it's oval, if it is baroque, and uh, what is the other one? And uh, luster, it's five virtues, luster and weight and diameter and the size mm -hmm. for natural pearls it's more more weight than the diameter and so um if you have it, the provenance is about offer and demand and when you have a really nice quality pearl like the marie antoinette with a royal provenance you you just have you just need two per people 
beating for the same pearl that the price goes to that crazy prices. The Baroda pearls are the same. They had great provenance, but the pearls were absolutely amazing. And um, sometimes provenance, it's much more important than quality and that the intrinsic quality of the gem material. But pearls are very tricky to evaluate in terms of their factors. And there is another one, which if you have one pearl, you have certain value. But you have, if you have another one mm. of that high standard, the, the value of the pair is more than the value of both of them together. But if you have a strand, yeah. and that's, I remember Adi Alfardan, he was um, um, in, the, in, in the webinar we did together on natural pearl market. He was saying that sometimes you need to wait a decade to assemble a really nice quality natural pearl. But if you want the top quality today, you must maybe you wait for decades. And that's how hard it is to find really high quality pearls. That all of a sudden you have a not so good quality pearl that belongs to, to a celebrity or to a queen or to an emperor. And there you go, the provenance goes up. But that's offer and demand and that's how market works. And the market is sovereign. Yeah, great. Thank you for, for answering that. Um, we, we, that term that you brought up in the in the presentation today, a pearl doctor. Um, there's a lot of people who got questions about that. They didn't know it existed. I mean, some people are wondering whether that pearl doctor can help us to come up with a vaccine for coronavirus. But um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I, I made that just at the wrong time, didn't I? Yeah, the very bad timing for humour because I was drinking. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. No, no comment. It was just a okay. comment. So we still have one minute. So uh, before we, we close down the, uh, the, the room, let me see if I can choose an easy question. Uh, oh, another uh, asks, what makes a pearl round or baroque? If we are talking natural pearls, it's fate. It's totally fate. Uh, we have mechanisms, of course, if the muscle moves because the muscles, they, they move on the seabed, they are not stuck. And so it has to do with movement, has to do with a lot of things, but basically it's fate. When you have a cultured pearl, if you have a round bead, a nucleus, I don't like to call it nucleus, it's a bead, a shell bead inside, it's the, the shape of the bead that controls the uh, external shape of the pearl particularly if the nacre uh, thickness is very small, like you have in a Koya cultured pearls, that you have a really small nacre thickness. It's good enough for wearing, it's durable, but it's not as, as thick as the South Sea or the Asian cultured pearl, that they, they sometimes they move away from the spherical shape of the nucleus because they grow bigger and bigger. Great, thank and, you. Uh, I think we moved like half an hour after the hour and um, I think I would call it uh, a day. Edward, what do you think? I mean, I, I could I, be here forever, but I have to take care of my kids and prepare dinner. So I was going to say, yeah, and I, I can smell somebody's cooking for me and I'm having the smell oh. coming through. So, you know, but you've done an amazing job as always, Rui, and everybody is so grateful for you on the chat. In fact, we've still got more than half of the people listening to this banter and questions at the end as we did the main presentation. So I think that's a testament to your ability this time to answer questions that you don't pick yourself. There you go. But you know, just, just to finish, let me tell you something. Uh, uh, I do a lot of public speaking, as you know, and sometimes when you are an, in the audience, you might have some really hard questions. Mm -hmm. And I did learn with the politicians how to dodge a very difficult question. And uh, the, the way, if, if there is anybody on the audience that does public speaking, it's really easy. You just listen to the question and you say, that's a very important question you just made. Thank you very much. But now what, what it's really important to underline is this and that and that, and then you don't respond. And the politicians, they do that all the time and they get away with it. Why shouldn't they? So that's- Absolutely. Rui for president. That's what we say. <laughs> Or for emperor. Sorry, for emperor. <laughs>
<laughs> so thank you very much, Edward. You've been brilliant. Thank you so much for your help. And you, you, you kept the, uh, you, you, I mean, it's, it, it, I can tell that you work for GIA because you, you, you did choose the hardest questions <laughs> so, so I could answer. Thank you very much for that. And I, I will call you on my private phone with yeah. some nasty words after. <laughs> You're welcome, anytime. So thank you very much, Chad. We did brilliantly. I, I really enjoyed having your, your, your co-editor co um, work uh, alongside myself in this webinar, entertaining our colleagues, colleagues, some of them still in action, some of them still not really uh, cheered up in their spirits. So that's the purpose of this webinar. It's actually to cheer you up, not to teach you actually information. If you want to learn information, you, I strongly recommend start reading a lot. In, in reading, you learn a lot. Reading is key. So thank you very much, Edward. Thank you, Steve Joe, for the support. And thank you, all of you, for being there with us uh, this uh, afternoon and spending 90 minutes with these two bold, really handsome and very sexy guys, one from Portugal, one from England, and we are about to cook dinner and to have dinner. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Ciao, Edward. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye now. Take care. Ciao.